Things change, but Deer Park Natural Spring Water is a constant you can count on, bringing you the essence of home for 150 years and counting. Sourced from carefully selected springs, Deer Park Natural Spring Water has naturally occurring electrolytes for a crisp, refreshing taste. Find Deer Park Natural Spring Water at your favorite local retailer today. After 150 years, there's only one thing left to say. Deer Park, that's still good water. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Grant, do you know what a beak is? B-E-E-K? I don't know. Uh, a bird watcher? Uh, um, different animal. Bzzz watches. Bailing whales. <laughs> <laughs> bees. Bees. Yeah. Wait, so beekeeper? Beekeepers call uh, themselves beaks. I just uh, learned that. B-E-E-K. I did not know that. Yeah. How yeah. about that? Beak? Yeah. And it got me thinking about fond terms that people have for themselves in their their Hobbies fellow... and pastimes yeah. and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, I came across another one just the other day, which is AFOLS. That's A-F-O-L. It's a it's an acronym. AFOLs. Do you know that one? A F O L. Uh huh. Mm, a fond overlooker. Uh, somebody who keeps an eye on the tiny railroads at, I don't know, I have no idea. You what know, is it's it? so funny that you're getting bits and pieces of the definitions when you talk about tiny railroads, because an AFOL is an adult fan of Lego. Oh. That? And that's what they call each other. There's a whole, there's several documentaries online about, about AFOLs. How about that? Yeah. AFOL, adult yeah. fan of Lego. How about yeah. that? And I guess they're not barefoot walking through the house, <laughs> how about right? about that? Yeah. So beaks and AFOLs. And what else you got on that sheet? Well, you know, I was thinking about the fact that, as you know, I do improv. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll hear people talk about being imps. Mm -hmm. We're imps, you know, my fellow imps. I, I don't hear that here in San Diego so much, but right. in other cities, yes. Imps, people who do improv. Yeah, How about yeah. That? So imps and AFOLs and beaks. There are tons of these. And I know our listeners are just dying to share what they call themselves and their hobbies and their pastimes, and right? I'm dying to hear Me it, too. whether you're gearhead. Or Foamer, yeah. whatever, metalhead even. Yeah. We know Anorak. these. <laughs> Anorak. We, the, but you got to go deeper than that. <laughs> Give us the rare ones, the unusual ones. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or share that odd nickname for you and your fellow hobbyists on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Welcome to Away With Words. Hey, what's up? Nothing. Who's this? This is Daryl Smyers. I'm calling from uh, Kip Pleasant Grove Middle School in the south southern part of Dallas, Texas. Welcome to the show. What can we do for you? Hi, Daryl. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm a big music fan. I've been a big Beatles fan my whole life, and I was listening to a Paul McCartney album. It came out in 1978, and on that album, on a song called Famous Groupies, he uses the term pulchritude. Now, I looked up polka too, and I've been teaching it to my kids for years, but the word like that, where it comes from, it kind of sounds kind of German, but I, I, I didn't have a clue where it came from. Hmm. Pulchritude. And by pulchritude, he meant what? He said the line says, the, these magnificent examples of female pulchritude and luminosity. And I believe when I looked it up, pulchritude meant something kind of like beauty on the inside. Well, yeah, it means beauty in general. It's it's not Germanic. It, it goes all the way back to Latin. And in fact, it's one of the very first words you ever learn in Latin class. Maybe like on the first day, the word pulcher, P-U-L-C-H-E-R, which means beautiful or handsome or fine. Pulchritude found its way into English in the early 15th century, uh, back when there were uh, people who actually spoke Latin and read it on a regular basis. I don't think it's a particularly lovely word. No. Do you, Grant? Not at no. all. Not at all. And so you've, you've got kind of this cognitive dissonance, right? Because it's, it's kind of a clunky... How would you describe it? What, what don't you like about it? Well, it almost even sounds like kind of a disease. Like I have a bad case of pulchritude. <laughs> 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 That's wonderful. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> but um, but yeah, why such an ugly word for or or just unattractive word for for such a beautiful thing? Might appreciate the words autological and heterological. When you are talking about an adjective that's autological, it's a word that describes itself. Like the like if you use English as an adjective, that's an autological adjective because 
English is an English word. Or if you, you use the word short, you know, short is a short word, so that's autological. And an adjective is heterological if it doesn't describe itself. So, for example, the word long is not a long word. And monosyllabic is a multisyllabic word. So I think what you've got here is a heterological adjective, actually. So pulchritude is heterological. <laughs> yes. It does not. And, and, and where in the world did Paul McCartney decide to use it in a song? I bet if we looked at a corpus grant, we'd see a lot of female next to pulchritude. You know, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's almost this sort of self-conscious uh, term that... Uh, a showy literary word that you yeah. pull out when you're just trying to show that you're, that you're clever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Paul McCartney, if anything, he is clever. Yeah, he's clever. certainly is. He's written some very beautiful, some of the best songs ever written, as far as I know. Yeah, so yeah. It, w- it wasn't like he needed a rhyme or something? No, it doesn't rhyme with anything. It's a very <laughs> strange song, so it, it's one of the strangest. And so he had, and he has some strange songs, so that's one of the strangest. Oh, that's, that's so interesting. Because it's not like mellifluous, which is oh. certainly autological, right? Yes. M- mellifluous is a beautiful word, Yes, yeah, right? beautiful sounding. Yeah. Of course, I guess, I guess it's sort of in the ear of the beholder, too. I mean, maybe, th- maybe we do have listeners who love the word pulchritude. Pulchritude. But, uh, <laughs> Even pulchre itself doesn't sound beautiful. No, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. Hey, I appreciate your time and giving me that answer. It's a great answer. Well, Daryl, I appreciate your giving us the idea of pulchritude as a, and we appreci- <laughs> as a disease. <laughs> and we appreciate our teachers as well, so keep up the good yeah. work. Hey, seventh grade, I got my work cut out for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, you I'm, do. I've got a seventh grader at home. I know all about that. <laughs> all right. Take Thanks care so now. much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Daryl. Bye-bye. Bye. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. Hello there. You have a way with words. Hi, this is Melissa from Hysteria, California. Hi, Melissa. Welcome. What can we do for you? I'm calling, actually, because I'm originally from Washington State, Tacoma, Washington. And uh, one of the things that uh, we had on the corner of our block was a corner store. So we literally had, like, a roll of houses, and on the corner there was a store, like a little liquor store type. Um, And my mom would let us walk down there. She had six kids, and she'd give us a few dollars each, and we would go down there. We'd get some corn dogs and a bag of JoJo's each. And it was about a dollar for, like, you know, maybe like 10 JoJo's. And when I came, became an adult, and I'm, I'm in California, and I'll go to the grocery store, and I'll ask for JoJo's, the people that I'm with will always look at me like, what? <laughs> and, but the person giving me the JoJo's always gives them to me. They always go straight for the potato wedges. They know what I'm talking about. But it seems like I've asked so, so many people. No one in California knows what JoJo's are. A lot of our listeners don't know what JoJo's are. You're going to have to explain, Melissa. Okay, so JoJo's are potato wedges. It's just potatoes. To me, french fries are french fries, yeah. but when they're a little thicker, they're potato wedges, but that's JoJo's to me. So for you, do JoJo's have the skin on the wedges? They do. And are they batter fried? Um, They might even be baked because they're not like, uh, they're not, yeah, they're not they don't have, they're not like, you know, fried chicken or anything like that. Yeah, they're, they're pretty soft. Mm-hmm. They're soft, but are, do, can you see the, can you see the skin? Can you see the surface of the potato or they have, have they been dipped yeah. in flour and then fried? No, no flour. Yeah, okay. you can see the surface. Okay. okay. So they're sort of like steak fries. Well, we, we know something about the story about why they're called Jojo potatoes. At least we think we do. There's a... A word researcher by the name of Barry Popick, he's a colleague and a friend of the show. You can find his work at barrypopick.com. And he's looked into this term, and he reached out to a man named Brad French, who now owns a a line of breading for food called Flavor Crisp. And the story that Brad French tells is that in the early 1960s, there was a food trade show in Chicago— And there was a line of equipment owned and operated by the Flavor Crisp Company where they were frying up fish and chicken to show off their fryers. And in between the fish and chicken, they would just throw in potatoes to cleanse the flavor of the oil. And they would just pull the potatoes out and kind of set them aside to discard them because they considered them just like garbage and trash. But what would happen is people coming by would eat the potatoes and and then they would say, hey, what are these potatoes called? Thinking that they were part of the food that was meant to be eaten. They were actually just trash. And one of the salesmen supposedly just blurted out, uh, JoJo's, instead of calling them <laughs> junk or trash or garbage. And so they started making those potatoes a thing, breading them. 
And they figured out later that you could quarter a russet potato and cook them with chicken, and they'd be done at the same time as chicken. And so the Jojo potatoes became a thing started by the Flavor Crisp Company. And so they became kind of established with the Flavor Crisp brand. And you can find Jojo potatoes here and there throughout the northern part of the United States now, from from Washington State over to New York State. And how are they spelled on those menus? Uh, usually J-O, J-O, sometimes as one word, sometimes with a hyphen. Oh, wow. See, I've all, every time I've said it, I've always put an S at the end. I've always just said JoJo's. Like, I would never say, oh, let's go get, like, a like a JoJo or anything. I would oh, say, yeah. Go JoJo's go plural. JoJo's. Sure, yeah. JoJo's plural. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Childhood memories. Yeah, Melissa, <laughs> yeah. thanks for sharing those memories with us. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. All right. Take <laughs> care you. now. Take Bye-bye. Care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Boy, food and memory are so tied uh, yeah. together. <laughs> food, language, and memory, right? The, the threesome right there. <laughs> 877-929-9673. Andrea Sansone teaches English as a second language, and on our Facebook group, she wrote, I've recently learned that the sentence, if you believe that, I have a bridge in Brooklyn to sell to you, is not an expression that English learners are familiar with. Is this a New York City area regional expression? If you don't use that particular expression to indicate being conned, what expression do you use? And that prompted a lively discussion. Oh, yeah, it sure did. Yeah. I don't think it's particularly regional, though. No, no. uh, Often it's not a Brooklyn bridge to sell you. Mm -hmm. It's just a bridge to sell you. A bridge to sell you. Because it's that famous scam, right? Right, right. There were uh, there was more than one scam mm-hmm. like that. There was a fellow named George C. Parker who produced these impressive forged documents that he sold to people who wanted to try to put toll booths on the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> Gave them the <laughs> and, rights and permission to yeah. collect tolls on the bridge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, different people brought up uh, the idea of I've got swampland to sell you in Florida. And several people mentioned the George Strait song which I didn't know, but apparently there's a George Strait song. I think it's called Oceanfront Property. And he says, if you leave me, I won't miss you and I won't ever take you back. Girl, your memory won't ever haunt me because I don't love you. Now, if you'll buy that, I've got some oceanfront property in Arizona. From my front porch, you can see the sea. I've got some oceanfront property in Arizona. If you buy that, I'll throw the Golden Gate in for free. (laughs) <laughs> so it's just taking advantage of people's bad understanding of geography, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because if you didn't, yeah. Arizona sounds exotic, right? Oh, yeah. The West, it's all about the Pacific Ocean, right? <laughs> Never mind that Arizona has to drive to San Diego to see the sea. <laughs> if you believe that, I've got a X blanket. to sell you. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Are there others of those? Might be. Eight, Let us know. 877-929-9673. Things change, but Deer Park Natural Spring Water is a constant you can count on, bringing you the essence of home for 150 years and counting. Sourced from carefully selected springs, Deer Park Natural Spring Water has naturally occurring electrolytes for a crisp, refreshing taste. Find Deer Park Natural Spring Water at your favorite local retailer today. After 150 years, there's only one thing left to say. Deer Park, that's still good water. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. And joining us on the line from New York City is our quiz guy, John Chinesky. Hello, John. Hey, John. Hi, Martha. Hello, Grant. What's up, bud? You know, when it gets cold out, I turn to the sun. That is, words and phrases that contain the letters S-U-N together and in order. Okay? For example... A person perceived to be an inexperienced and unskillful motorist, especially one who lacks speed, is known by what sunny phrase? Sunday driver. Yeah, Sunday driver, indeed. So all of these words, all of the answers to this quiz will contain the letters S-U-N. Again, again, they'll be together and in order. Either the beginning, the middle, or the end. Here we go. As definitions go, this is as nonspecific as you can get. It's a word for various miscellaneous items. I think of it as things you purchase in a drugstore. 
Sundry. Sundries, yes, very good. While there's no real medical reason to say anything when anyone sneezes, many people prefer to wish you good health with this word derived from a foreign language. Gesundheit. Gesundheit, Gesundheit indeed. For those of you who are of a spiritual bent, there is an adjective that refers to seven weeks after Easter when the Holy Spirit is reported to have descended upon Jesus' disciples. Something that Sunday? Whit- Whitsuntide? It is Whitsun, yes. Whitsun or Whitsuntide. Nicely done. Now, if you're writing to the officer in charge of a ship's rigging, anchors, cables, and deck crew, you can use the ungainly nine-letter word which landlubbers mispronounce as boatswain or what rather economical five-letter word that is pronounced the correct way. I usually get it wrong. I'm going to say it wrong. <laughs> it's, is it bosun or bosun? Bozen. It's bosun. Bozen. Yeah, bosun is fine. But you don't want to say boatswain. That that boat really uh, sets you apart as a uh, as wrong. Or as a Even, reader because you don't actually go up at sea and you don't know. The nine-letter word, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, it was a 1964 blues ballad written for Nina Simone. But in 1965, an up-tempo cover version by The Animals became a top 40 hit. Finish this lyric, which ends with the song's title. I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Oh, Lord, please don't let me be... Misunderstood. 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 Yes, there's our son in the middle. The word's origins are unclear. Perhaps because it was sold on Mondays and consisted of leftover product, or it was sold on another day to circumvent blue laws, it doesn't matter to me. It's cold and creamy and delicious, and it's called... Oh, Sunday. Sunday, yes. Now, there are many sunny places in South America, and Paraguay's climate ranges from tropical to subtropical, so it makes sense that what city is its capital? Asuncion. Asuncion, yes. Finally, watch out. English has borrowed this word from Japanese, where it's a combination of the words for harbor and wave. Tsunami. Tsunami, exactly, yes. T S U N. A-M-I. Very good. Those are my sunny words for a cool day. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. We'll talk to you next week. Talk to you then. Really appreciate it. Give our best to the family. Will do. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, we're talking about language today, and we want your calls. 877-929-9673. Email us, too, and we'll talk about that. Words at waywardradio.org. Hi there. You have a way with words. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. I'm doing well. Who are you, and where are you calling from? My name is Jess Rodriguez, and I am calling from Keller, Texas. Welcome to the show, Jess. What can we do for you? Well, last year, my husband and I were talking about our newborn son, um, his fingers, his toes, and uh, his baby's breath, his little breath. And it kind of got us talking about where the flower, I guess, baby's breath gets its name. And I wanted to know, uh, is there some kind of correlation between the two? And and that's why I'm calling you today. Hmm. Do you have theories? No, not really. For some reason, to me, it sounded kind of Victorian. Um, you know, or maybe it had something to do with lace, but, you know, that's really all I could naturally come up with. Mm-hmm. And what's your baby's breath like? You know, he's actually got like morning, you know, morning breath because he's a little <laughs> bit older. But back then, you know, when he was newborn, he was, I mean, perfect, right? Right. Oh, of course. Right. And then reality of sets course. in. You know. <laughs> of course. And then reality sets in. Then he falls off the bed a couple times and he's got some dents <laughs> <Yeah>. and scratches. <laughs> He wakes you up in the middle of the t- night a few times. Yeah. Uh huh. Did it smell like baby's breath flowers? I mean, I, I assume that you smelled those and tried to see if there was a similarity. You know, it's funny. I uh, I used to be a florist way back in the day, and I used to work with baby's breath a lot. And uh, I did not think that they smelled similar whatsoever. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, maybe just my son's breath doesn't smell like that. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't smell like flowers. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people do think that there's a, a there's a similarity. There's a a gentleness about the smell mm-hmm. of the plant and the smell of baby's breath. It's not so much that they're the same. It's just the the lightness of it. Mm-hmm. Does that make the sense? Softness. The softness yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. It's um, subtle. It's the subtleness of it. And other people just say that they're both, um, they kind of catch you unawares. But mm-hmm. I think a lot of this is just um, people just trying to make the correlation after the fact. So... Yeah. Um, the the plant itself I can see that. this plant itself is fairly insubstantial, right? Super fragile, yeah. right? It's not this the hardiest of plants at all. 
Mm-hmm. Since the mid 1800s, the plant has had that name and been used in flower arrangements. There's a lot of different uh, varieties of it, uh, subspecies and species of it. Um, the Latin name of it is interesting. If you're interested in that, uh, yes, I am. Gypsophila paniculata means uh, yeah. gypsum lover. Um, the gypsophila does because it prefers a, a lime based soil, and the paniculata refers to the spreading flower clusters the way that the, they branch out and kind of these mm-hmm. clusters and all right sure, okay and i'm sure if you were doing flower arranging i mean the the baby's breath in, in an arrangement you, you don't just hand somebody an arrangement of baby's breath mm-hmm. right it's, it's no. just a little right little fillip a little accent exactly mm-hmm. and from, yeah. a, from a distance it's kind of hard to make out when it's amongst the other flowers right mm-hmm. the baby's breath it's kind of just a, it's a space filler that doesn't it's it does it goes unnoticed really Mm. Yeah, it's very gentle in its arrangement. Like, it's very soft. It doesn't make a big presence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess the bottom line is that we don't really have a firm etymology no. on baby's breath, but we can speculate. There's something about the subtleness, though, that perhaps... The subtleness. Invited, that makes sense. Yeah, invited the comparison. Yeah. Jess, thank well, you so okay. much for well, your call. That answers my question. All right, take care. Thanks thank for coming. Thank you, calling. guys. Bye-bye. All righty, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Baby's breath. Baby head flowers. That's what I want. That smell the top of a baby's head. That was the smell that I always loved. Oh, oh, oh. When that would be good, right? When you're holding them oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. bend the nose down yeah. and you inhale. Yeah. Oh, that's the best. Yeah, boy. If somebody Even when they're not at their that. best, when it's not, they haven't recently bathed, something about a baby. <laughs> right, the top of their head. <laughs> top of their head. I don't know what it is. 877-929-9673. from Greg Dolkus in Auburn, California, who said he was listening to one of our old episodes where we were talking about the term for the person who drives the ice cream truck through residential neighborhoods, mm-hmm. you know, with the music playing and all that, because it turned out that in Nebraska, primarily, you call that person the, the ding-ding man. The ding-ding man. Mm-hmm. Greg said that brought back memories for him, and he writes... Years ago, when our children were small, the ice cream truck would come through our neighborhood. My wife and I referred to it as the music truck, (laughs) never mentioning the delectable desserts contained therein. This avoided the inevitable whining we knew we would get, and the kids continued their play while listening to the music in the background as the truck drove by. (laughs) Very effective. (laughs) Yeah, he says, fast forward to a conversation with our now-grown children. At some point in their lives, we don't know quite when, they figured out what it was. But by then the truck was no more. They still haven't forgiven us. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't the stickers of all the yummy treats on the side of the you truck a giveaway? Think, you would think. Maybe they were playing below the living room windowsill right, or something. Right, so they just like, couldn't see. Yeah. Oh, the nice music truck. <laughs> 877 929 9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, Martha. This is Sam from Westfield, Indiana. Hi, Sam. Welcome. Thank you. What can we do for you? So I uh, work in human services, and I had a client's mother use the phrase, you cannot cover the sun with a finger. And it's one of those phrases that you can kind of figure out what it means. But I wanted to know if you had any stories for the origin of it. What was the situation where it came up? We were trying to work on a a few things, a few uh, more than, than she intended to. So just more than she was able to work on at one time. So you had a lot of problems and mm-hmm. the more she bit off more than only she could so chew much time. and yep. only so much time and so the expression was you cannot cover the sun with one finger mm-hmm. yes okay hmm. what else can you tell us about the person who used this expression um she's from puerto rico but i looked it up and it looked like it may have come from cuba martha you speak some spanish argentinian spanish did you mm. know this one uh, not from Argentina, but I, I know the phrase. Yeah. Tapar el sol con un dedo. Tapar mm-hmm. el sol con un dedo, to, mm-hmm. to cover the sun with a finger. Yeah, and I think the idea is that, uh, you know, you're deluding yourself if you think that you can that you can hide the sun just by holding up your finger. It may look that mm-hmm. way to you, but, but you're not extinguishing the sun. Right, so there's two notions of this. One is you're solving the problem for yourself, but not for other people. Right, right. but the yeah. other thing is it's just kind of a Band-Aid on a really big problem, right? Right. A tiny right. fix that doesn't really solve it for everyone, yeah. <laughs> or solve the whole thing. 
it's not just Cuban or Puerto Rican. It is used throughout the Spanish-speaking cultures. I've found versions of this in, in, in Cuba and Puerto Rico, but also in Mexico and Spain and some in Uruguay and Paraguay and some yeah. other Spanish-speaking countries. So you will find it throughout the Spanish-speaking countries. But, you know, I've found a variant of this in other countries where it's you can't cover the sun with the palm of your hand. and this, But okay. this is from a different set of countries, and they tend to be Muslim countries. So um, Nigeria, North Africa, Serbia, I've found that as far back as 1915. No doubt in both cases these expressions are much older than we think that they are. And mm -hmm. it's exactly the same kind of uses. It's all about you've bitten off more than you can chew or you're trying to fix a big problem with a small solution uh, in mm -hmm. every single case. So I mm -hmm. do tend to see these being used very often these days in political contexts where opponents are accused of treating uh, big problems in small ways. So they, mm -hmm. they have a weird context to them where they're not the kind of thing you'd say typically um, these days. I don't see them in fiction. I haven't seen them very often in fiction, so I don't know. I don't have a sense of it as an English saying. No, me neither. I don't no, know. No, I hadn't heard it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, biting off more than one can chew is kind of, yeah, a good, what... kind of a good transition, but it doesn't work perfectly because it doesn't mm -hmm. encompass mm -hmm. all the different ways that these are used. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. idea to which came first, the uh, palm or the finger? No, I don't know. They're hard to track mm -hmm. because I don't have any Serbian or the other languages. I've only found these in translation from these other languages in English. So this is the best that I can do for you. Sorry, bud. That's all right. Yeah. I appreciate the help. Yeah, sure. Thanks for calling. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. 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 Well, we know you've had an encounter at your job where somebody said something that mystified you, and it's a thing. It's an expression. It's an idiom or an aphorism or a saying. Call us, and we'll try to sort it out. 877-929-9673. Words at waywardradio.org or on Twitter, W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Following up on our conversation about ways that you can haze a newbie on the job, we heard from Mike Taylor who says, when I was in the Coast Guard and basic training, they taught us that we were not to call rope rope. We were to call it line. One of the first pranks that they would play on you when you got to the ship was to send you down below for 100 feet of shoreline. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> he added the ha, ha, ha. <laughs> 100 feet of shoreline. Har, har, har. <laughs> Where do I find that? 877-929-9673. <laughs> Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this Hi. is Lynn Thomas. I'm calling from Grapevine, Texas. Welcome to the show. What can we do for you, Lynn? Well, um, I grew up in the Midwest, mostly Illinois, and I remember if I dressed myself um, when I was younger, my mom or dad might say to me, that's quite a getup, or where did you get that getup? And I knew that this was not a compliment. It was um, <laughs> something about what I was wearing it looked a little strange or funny. <laughs> and I couldn't see any connection between the words get up and clothes. So I was just wondering uh, where that might have come from. Huh. <laughs> so it was always something outlandish or didn't, didn't match or most normal people wouldn't wear outside the house. Exactly. Um, maybe wearing shorts with boots or some kind of costume or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the kind of thing a kid would love to wear because it's showy and expressive and, uh, you know, they're not bound by the normal rules, right? Exactly. Not altogether yes. that embarrassed like an adult would be. Or a... Yes, <laughs> they're a little free-for-all. You know, it's, it's actually fairly simple. Originally, uh, starting in the seven, late 1700s, you could... Of get up as a verb, a person or a room or a theatrical production in a certain way. You, you were dressing them or arranging them or decorating them, dressing them in finery, putting up silks or, or uh, elaborate um, paper or or anything just to, to make them wonderful and lovely and gorgeous. And then by mm -hmm. the mid 1800s, the noun form of get up appeared to refer to the arrangement or the appearance itself. And then later, much later, the kind of simplified, almost neutered version that we have now, meaning just a kind of gaudy uh, outfit, appeared. So, 
Uh-huh. And that's it. So well, we went from something very elaborate, like a fantastic theatrical uh, design, to just uh, a kid wearing, a, you know, a s- s- snow boots and a swimming suit. <laughs> <laughs> I like the swimming suit. Boots. <laughs> I used to say it to my daughters as well. They are they're in their forties, but they clearly remember me saying it to them, and I'm sure it was along the lines that you're talking about. <laughs> you're going so, out in that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You just kind of knew it was something strange or funny you were wearing, and it was a good idea to maybe change, but (laughs) I don't remember being told that I had to change. But you kind of knew, maybe I better not go out in this. (laughs) Yeah, somewhere in the middle before we got to kind of what you're talking about, where the get-up is a really kind of gaudy or mismatched outfit is the idea of a mm-hmm. get-up being a complicated outfit, something involving a lot of layers or a lot of straps or uh, just think oh. about uh, the some of the women's outfits in the 1700s and 1800s where there's skirts and petticoats corsets and silks mm-hmm. and corsets and booted that mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing, yeah. So but that's see. a get-up where it's just, you know, two hours to get dressed. <laughs> You have to get up a couple hours early, (laughs) right? Get up to put on the get up. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Tell me a little bit more about when it was used as a verb in the 1700s. Yeah. It was somebody dressing somebody else. Um, yeah, somebody dressing somebody else, but it was it wasn't even just people. It was about mm-hmm. hair. Uh, you know, you might uh, you might get up someone's hair. You might get up someone's appearance. You might have your maid get up your your outfit for you. But you might also get up a theater to decorate it for a performance or to put on the 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 scenery or to to put up the curtains and the stage setting in the right way. You might get up a book to to produce it and so that you are. Mm putting the plates together and putting the images together and all that sort of stuff. Well, I never dreamed it went back that far. Mm -hmm. Well, Lynn, thanks so much for calling. You are very welcome. I enjoyed talking with you, and I love your show. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Lynn. Take care. Uh Bye-bye. Bye. In his book, A Mouthful of Air, the writer Anthony Burgess talks about grammar, and he says... Grammar has its own fascination, and in a ghostly manner, its own peculiar truth. There is a satisfactory boniness about grammar, which the flesh of vocabulary, or lexis, requires before it can become vertebrate and walk the earth. That's beautiful. That's very lovely. What's the book again? Uh, a Mouthful of Air. Which is which, a great title for a book, too. Yeah, yeah. I want to go read it now because he had a real fascination with languages and foreign languages. And, and I love what he says about the boniness of grammar. Ah, uh, boniness of grammar. The structure in which everything hangs. Yes. <laughs> and then it gets up and walks. Words at waywardradio.org. Hey, we've got something special for those of you who love our show but could do without the ads. That's right. Imagine a way with words, the same engaging conversations, the same deep dives into language without advertising interruptions. We're talking about our ad-free podcast feed. It's sleek, clean, and it's just for our supporters. It's at waywardradio.org slash ad-free. It's inexpensive, easy to sign up for, and works with all major podcast apps like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's an affordable way to support the show and get a seamless listening experience. And if you're feeling generous, why not give a subscription to another Away With Words fan? That's waywardradio.org slash adfree. Sign up today. Your support means the world. waywardradio.org slash Ad free. Thank you. You're listening to Away with Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. I'm seeing more and more people use the word Google Ganger. You know this term, right? Mm-hmm, it's it's yeah. like adapted from doppelganger in German, which means double goer, like mm-hmm. somebody's double. Uh, but a Google Ganger is a person with the same name as oneself whose online references are mixed among one's own search results. Um, Grant, I, I get Google alerts for you, and I see that you have at least one Google Ganger. Oh, a, a whole bunch. I think I first encountered this word in 2007, by the mm-hmm. way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get Google gingers from Australia and New Zealand and uh, 
kid playing soccer in Alabama. There's yeah. a judge in California. Right. And uh, <laughs> uh, there was one who died in Texas, actually, with my name. Oh, Yeah, gee. poor guy. Wow. Well, there's another Martha Barnett without the E on the end. In I Florida. almost met her because we were at, at the Word of South Festival there at the <laughs> same time, but we just missed each other. But um, there's also, with the E, with the E on the end of Barnett, there's the Martha Barnett Golf Classic in uh, South Carolina. How about that? <laughs> I did meet one of the Grant Barrett Google Gangers uh-huh. when we did our show in Dallas a oh, few that's years ago. Right. He is a great guy, stagehand. Well, of course he is. It was a stagehand right. at the theater in Texas, and I have a photo with him. Yeah. Two Grant Barretts on stage that's together. Right. It was fantastic. Yeah. How about that? What could be better? Grant and Martha on <laughs> yeah, the, stage together. I was, it was like two Time Lords meeting. It was kind of wonderful. <laughs> I looked for the blue box. <laughs> Why do I think that uh, we probably are going to hear some other Google Ganger stories? I would love to hear some more. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a couple of famous ones of the guy who made the film with all the people with his name. Uh, there's a couple of festivals that have happened with people who all have the same common name. They oh, get together. Yeah, that would be cool. The thing that I think I've mentioned this before, the thing that I want to do is that there's a county in Minnesota. The county is Grant, and the county seat is Barrett. And oh, I'm, my gosh. And I want to go there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I want all the Grant Barretts in the world to go there. That would be delightful. <laughs> We'd love to hear your Google Ganger stories. Call us, 877-929-9673, or email us, words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, Martha. My name is Ben Fluitt. I'm calling from Richmond, Virginia. Welcome, Ben. Hi, how are you? Doing well, and Grant's here too. Hey, bud, what's up? What can we do for you? Hi, Grant. Um, I'm calling today because I watched the documentary Salesman uh, not too long ago, and they kept saying, believe you me, and I was just wondering where that expression came from. Now, I don't know anything about that documentary. Salesman? Yeah, why were they saying it a lot? Uh, it's Albert Mazel's, I think, did it, and um, it was, I want to say, like, I'm 22, so I'm going to date myself a little bit, but I want to say it's like the mid-70s or something like that. But it's uh, just a ton of old dudes running around selling a a Bible. And they were just all, you know, talking about how they weren't getting sales, and they'd go, believe you, me. And I realized no one said that anymore. (laughs) And everyone was saying it in this movie. Okay. And so the documentary? Yeah. Okay. So huh. it was filmed in the 70s? Ah, or... oh, jeez. I honestly think so, but okay. it might have even been sooner. Okay. Or not sooner, earlier. So your question is, what's up with Believe You Me? <laughs> yes. And you don't say it. Oh, no, absolutely not. If I have to say something like that, just say, oh, believe me. How did it strike mm-hmm. you besides sounding a little out of date? Um... I think it was the usage of both you and me. You're saying, believe you, me. So it sounded a little bit weird to me because you're like, oh, trust me, but also (laughs) believe in yourself. (laughs) Okay. Well, one of the reasons it sounds weird to you, I think, is because the word order is different than English usually has it. Usually we do subject, verb, object in modern English. Uh, this has a verb, subject, object. Right. So that's the problem. We would just say, believe <laughs> yeah. me. Mm-hmm. Believe or me. You, you believe you, me. You believe me instead of believe right. you me. And so what's happening is there's a little bit of emphasis. Now, I noticed that in Fowler's new modern English usage guide, which I don't actually check that often because I consider it a little stodgy and out of date, but um, I checked it for some reason, and it calls this usage condescending. And I thought about that for a while, why they would see it as condescending. I think really my reaction to that is I see believe you me as actually emphatic and distancing. And we've talked about distancing on the show. It's a way of being both firm and a little more informal. So you take a little bit of the sting out of expressing your certainty. And I think that might be what you were hearing from those salesmen. That's so interesting. And that makes a lot of sense, too, because they were kind of bitter that no one was buying their Bibles. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting that you mentioned Bibles because it's a construction that you see a fair amount in the King James Version. You see, hear ye me and command ye me, which is also kind of distancing, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I don't wow, know. That that is, yeah, that's really interesting that's right. because I think in the, in the, 
the context of the Bible, it makes a lot of sense just because there is that sort of separation that's emphasized between, you know, the holier than thou and then those that are just, you know, believers and whatnot. Really interesting stuff. Hmm. This uh, rose to popularity in the 1920s for some reason. It really kind of came to the fore, this particular Believe You Me in the 18. 18- 80s-ish. But in the 1920s, it just kind of pops up. A lot of stuff changed in language and after the First World War. And it had this vogue uh, period in the 1920s and never really completely faded. Even now, you still will hear it. I don't think it's as popular as it was. It does seem a little dated now. I have heard it um, unironically from people in the mm-hmm. last year. And it catches wow. your ear. Yeah, it does catch your ear. Right? Because it's that, that word order. that yeah. When you hear verb, subject, object, you're like, Huh? I understand yeah. what you mean, but that's not right. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Yeah, our pleasure, Ben. Thanks for calling. Take care. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Take care. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or talk to us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Here's a word I learned this week, and I really like it. It's synanthrope. That's S-Y-N-A-N-T-H-R-O-P-E. And you might be able to guess from the Greek roots there, syn meaning together, Mm -hmm. and then the anthrope meaning human. Human, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, synanthropes are animals that aren't pets, but that live and thrive close to humans, Mm -hmm. like, like pigeons and raccoons and rats. It's not that common a word, but it's been around since the 1940s. And the reason I learned that word is because I was reading about something called the Synanthrope Preserve, and it's an audio tour of New York City that encourages listeners to see that place as a habitat for both human and animal residents. It's the work of artist Gal Nassim and experienced designer Jessica Scott Dutcher, and you can listen to these audio tours at synpreserve.com. That's S-Y-N-P-R-E-S-E-R. V-E dot com, Sin Preserve. I listened to some of it, even though I wasn't walking around mm-hmm. New York City, and it was just a really interesting way of looking at these animals whose habitat we share. Mm-hmm. Instead of thinking it as a human space, think of it as an animal space, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're So you're in the interloper instead of yes. them being the interloper. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, and most human spaces are like that. Mm-hmm. Even here in San Diego, I encounter foxes and skunks and possums in my yard and rats and mice and feral cats and oh yeah and yeah gof- we're, we're gophers and all kinds of things yeah we're on a canyon and mm, yeah, uh, and we run into coyotes all the time mm-hmm. yeah 877-929-9673 or talk to us on twitter at w-a-y-w-o-r-d hello you have a way with words hi hi who's this uh, this is anna i am calling from alden michigan it's uh beautiful lake country where I live. Well, hey, Anna, welcome to the show. What can we do for you? I I kind of have a a recollection of when I was a young girl. I remember being interested in vocabulary, and I remember uh, a funny story, and that story entails uh, finding under a pillowcase in my parents' bedroom a little small plastic package and my mom's reaction when she saw me finding it was that she grabbed it from me and put it back in the linen closet. And I was kind of a curious and resourceful child. So I went to the said linen closet and got that small package and armed myself with a dictionary and then looked up the word. And the word I found was prophylactic. <laughs> so, ah. so I was curious about the origins of the word and I looked it up and see that it's a noun and an adjective, but I thought, you tell me what you know about that. (laughs) (laughs) Anna, I love that, that you were how old? Oh, I'm guessing maybe eight or nine, like third or fourth grade. I mean, I do have a recall, but I'm I'm just guessing maybe. That's a long time ago. Uh I'm 67, so... Well, I, okay. I love your phrase, I was armed with a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> good weapon. <laughs> yes, it is a good weapon. It is. Okay, our spin on the word prophylactic, which uh, usually means, these days it means uh, a condom, right? Correct. 
Well, you know, this word has always interested me because of um, its Greek root. I, I can remember reading ancient Greek and coming across the word phylax in ancient Greek, which means guard or sentinel. You know, it's 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 somebody who, who makes sure that you don't get in. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. And so that's spelled P-H-Y-L-A-X in English. But, but phylax gave us the word uh, prophylactic and prophylaxics. If you go to to your um, your dentist for a teeth cleaning, what they're doing is dental prophylaxis. That's what they call it. Correct. Yeah, it's like preventative, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, guard. exactly. Well, it's, and mm-hmm. it's interesting mm-hmm. that you mention preventative and preventive, the variant there, uh, because for a long time, that was the term in English used for condom. Prophylactic doesn't come along until I think the mid, uh, mid what, 20th century? Yeah, it's it's a relatively recent use of that term, prophylactic, meaning something that prevents things. Usually, in the past, it was it was used for disease. Right. But I, I just love that the Greek root is this, you know, little guy with <laughs> with a sword or a spear or something being a guard. <laughs> That's funny. That is funny. Thank you so much for your call. Okay. You have a great day. All right. Bye bye. Bye now. Bye bye. Bye. We love those long-lost memories about your stories involving language, and we'd love to hear yours. So call us, 877-929-9673, or send it to us in email, words at waywardradio.org. We had a conversation a while back about the first really big word that you learned, the one that you just couldn't wait to show off to adults. And that prompted a message from Patricia Lawler, who said, Mine was anti-disestablishmentarianism, which I proudly walked around spouting when I was, oh, I think five years old, because my mother was really into words and language. So I learned that word, and now I'm 83. And I still don't know what it means, but I enjoy being able to say it. (laughs) So, Patricia, properly, it means opposition to the disestablishment of the Church of England. But most of the time, it's just a word that you find in collections of really long words. Gotcha. 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Vivian Kraft from San Antonio. Hi, Vivian. Welcome to the show. I have a question for you. Um, My father who was born in 1913 in Pine County or Pine City, Minnesota, used to always use the phrase when we arrived home in St. Paul, where we lived, after a vacation. And he would drive in, you know, put the car in neutral or or turn it off, and he would go home again, home again, jiggity jig. It's the only time he ever used that phrase. And I've never heard anyone else in the Midwest, in Minnesota, in areas that I grew up, use the phrase. No one in the relatives, no one except my father. And I was just wondering if you guys knew where it might have come from. Oh, Vivian, absolutely. My mother from the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia used to always do that. When I was a little kid, every time we would pull into the driveway, she would do the same thing. She would she would stop the car, say, home again, home again, jiggity jig, and then she would turn off the car and shove that emergency brake. I remember <laughs> how that felt, just shoving that emergency brake. But it was always that little ditty. It was so funny because, like I said, he never used it. My mother never used it. None of, you know, my father came from a family of eight brothers and sisters. No one else ever used it, just my dad. Well, would you believe it's really, really, really old? It goes back to an old nursery rhyme that has to do with the idea of farmers taking things to market and going to the market to get things. And one old version of it goes, to market, to market, to buy a fat pig, home again, home again, jiggity jig. To market, to market, to buy a fat hog, home again, home again, jiggity jog. To market, to market, to buy a plum bun, home again, home again, market is done. 
And this goes back a couple hundred years at least. And I think that the jiggity jig and the jiggity jog in that has to do with just kind of the way that farmers ride in wagons, you know, that that motion. There's another nursery rhyme that actually goes, this is the way farmers ride jiggity jog, jiggity jog. And so I think it really evokes that feeling of of being on a bumpy wooden wagon. Yeah, that nursery rhyme was a, a game where the child rides on the adult's knee. Yeah, and so it's one of, one of those things where you hold the kid's hand and you try to bounce them up and down on your knee and so they fall off at the end of it, right? And you're <laughs> yeah, recreating yeah, exactly. that experience, right? <laughs> and so that jiggity jog attached to the home again, home again mm-hmm. from a, a different rhyme mm-hmm. and they form together in a new rhyme. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it's kind of lovely, isn't it, the way that that, that old image and that old feeling yeah. uh, got reapplied into... Automobiles. <laughs> yeah. Far from Your markets and, and wagons. Actually, yeah. it, make, it, it, it truly makes sense because my father was raised on a farm in Pine County oh. and, spent, and spent his first 23 years actually farming. Oh, well, there you go. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for looking that up, and I didn't realize that that's where it came from. It's very old. Yeah, centuries old. Are you carrying it on, by the way? Uh, actually, my son, my oldest son, uh, would when he, you know, heard my father saying it, he decided that he would add a little phrase of his own at the end, and yeah. so it was home again, home again, jiggity jig, and therefore we have another jig. <laughs> and therefore we have another jig. That was what he added. Yeah, I mean, it was like, okay, sure, that's <laughs> fine, Garrett. Whatever you want. <laughs> Thanks for calling, Vivian. Thank you for your time Take and care. your research. All right, okay. bye-bye. Bye now. Thanks. Bye-bye. 877-929-9673. If you ever need a word for a really meaty burp. The, no. The word, no. <laughs> well, if you do, the word is nidorosity. N- spell that, please. Uh, N-I-D-O-R-O-S-I-T-Y. Nidorosity. Uh, well, I'm pescatarian <laughs> these days, so I won't be needing that. Thanks. But. Well, I'm not sure what, what that word would be, but but the Latin word nidor is, is a vapor or a steam or a smell from anything that's roasted or burned. Wow. And uh, yeah, Samuel Johnson included nidorosity in his uh, 1755 dictionary. Uh, he defined it as eructation with the taste of undigested roast meat. Eructation. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> Your definition should not be more difficult than the word you're defining. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was for all the nine-year-olds out there. Nidorosity. Nidorosity. <laughs> 877-929-9673. Thanks to senior producer Stephanie Levine, director Colin Tedeschi, editor Tim Felton, and production assistant Caitlin O'Connell. You can send us a message, subscribe to the podcast, get the newsletter, or catch up on hundreds of past episodes at waywardradio.org. Our toll-free line is always open in the U.S. and Canada, 877-929-9673. Or send us your thoughts to words at waywardradio.org. Away With Words is an independent production of Wayward, Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who are changing the way the world talks about language. We're coming to you from the Recording Arts Center at Studio West in San Diego, California. Thanks for listening. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Until next time, goodbye. Bye. Hey, listeners, we have a favor to ask. We'd love for you to fill out our listener survey at gum.fm slash words. Your feedback is crucial. It's quick, and it helps us make our show even better. It shapes our show, helps us plan, and ensures we're bringing you the content you love. That's G-U-M dot F-M slash W-O-R-D-S. Thanks for being a part of what we do. Thank you.